This episode contains adult themes and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. This is They Will Kill, a true crime podcast. I'm Sadie Eck. And I'm Courtney Eck. And we are your hosts. Super excited to be here with you. Don't know really what's happening in the story tonight. I'm a little worried. I think it's going to be really scary. (laughs) (laughs) Or maybe intense. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. It's not an easy one, but (laughs) there's a big reveal. I'm just going to say it's an old-timey tale, and... It's about World War II. I don't like old-timey crime. It doesn't scare me. But please don't turn it off. It's a good one. And there's a big surprise at the end. So stick with it. Yeah. I think we should just get right to it right now. Let's do it. I'm so excited. (laughs) I agree. I agree with you. And here we go. Uh, So today I'm going to be telling you the story of the Chichijima incident. Mm. Chichijima. Chichijima. Wow. It's the sister island of Iwo Jima, the more famous Mm -hmm. island Iwo Jima, which we'll get into a little bit more later, but that's just a little quick reference. So this story covers the bombing missions of the five mile long Japanese island Chichijima. The bombings were carried out by what were referred to as American flyboys. And this story is about five specific flyboys and their capture after bombing the island of Chichijima. Mm. Yeah, man. Get ready to say a lot of like, oh, God. Oh, God. It's one of those stories. Okay. I'm ready. (laughs) (laughs) So the details of their capture were actually classified for several decades because the details were so awful. They had a war crime trial in Guam. And after the trial regarding this incident, the United States government was like, that is so awful. We want to close that up and not let their families know. So just, yeah, just to give you a little insight into the journey I'm going to about to take you on. (laughs) So they eventually declassified the documents. And that's when James Bradley wrote the book, Flyboys, A True Story of Courage, which is where I got almost every bit of information for the story. There are a lot of articles, like quick one-off articles about it, but I couldn't find anything that gave any sort of detail. And this book is actually phenomenal. It's a great book. I highly recommend it. It did kind of ruin my life because (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if you guys know anything about World War II, but it was fucked. It is Mm -hmm. horrible. And I will also say then I'm going to take you on a little bit of a choose your own adventure as far as the horror is concerned. I'm only, there's only two details that I'm going to give at two different points and I will give a big old heads up before I give those details. So you can choose to listen to them or not listen to them. Um, but for the most part, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go too far into it um, because your imagination will take you there and you know, war is hell and we don't need to <laughs> bog ourselves down with all the details of world war two. Do I get to choose? Do I have to listen to everything? Uh, I mean, listen. <laughs> I'm kidding. You can take, I'm in your, it. <laughs> take your headphones off and then I'll send you a text when I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> no, I'm um, here for all of it. I'm ready. Yeah. Yep. Also, I do want to say, you know, I am not a historian. I'm not a journalist. Please. I try, I've really, really spent a lot of time on this story and I really tried to get my details straight, but um, this book was written in a narrative fashion. So there, you know, it's like entertainment, it's nonfiction, but it was written to entertain also. So there was a lot of, you know, going between incidences and going from the United States back to Japan to China, you know, so it, I tried my best, but please forgive me. If I did get something wrong, I would love to know that. And I can, I can issue a correction next time, but you know, be gentle. I also, one more note, and then I'll jump into it. But, uh, the book is written in a very measured way. Like this guy is not super pro rah, rah, rah America. He's not anti-America, but he's not. He presents both sides very evenly um, and really describes really well what got us to each point in the war because it's incredibly complicated and it's not just the Japanese are evil and American is great or, or you know, or vice mm-hmm. versa. So I do want to be very clear that this is not anti-Japan. I am a huge fan of J- Japanese people and their culture and their country and 
their history, but there were just a handful of very, very evil people in charge of the entire world right around the same time. And hence we had this big, awful war. So all of those clarifications and qualifications aside, let me take you on this um, trip back to Japan in World War II. So I'm going to skip over a lot of the history. We're going to go straight from the transition from honorable samurai, which is what we're all more familiar with in Japanese history, to and just jump straight to the brutal death army, um, (laughs) which (laughs) began with the Japanese army field regulations of 1912. So again, there's a lot that led up to this, but at this point in the history of the Japanese military, service was the responsibility of impoverished farm boys. And any level of Japanese elite were given deferments. Wow. Yep. They were referred to as Isen Gorin. And quote, when the Isen Gorin arrived at boot camp, they entered a brutal gulag of horrors. They had no human rights. They were non-persons. So this new regime of officers, quote, assumed the mantle of the samurai past only to corrupt Japan's proud Bushido which means the way of the warrior tradition. Similar to our boy Jeffrey Lundgren a few episodes ago, how he bastardized the Mormon religion to satisfy his sadistic whims, the Japanese imperial army twisted Bushido to create a brutal army of non-humans. Wow. Yeah. After that, I wrote (laughs) clenchy clenchy teeth emoji. (laughs) Uh (laughs) I am am that actual emoji right now with my face. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. So they took this... The main way they reworked Bushido was by teaching a, quote, cult of death by guaranteeing soldiers that they would die for the emperor after enlistment. Holy shit. Yeah. So you are being drafted and you will die. That Hmm. is, it is not, a goal here is not to come out alive. Right. Quote, this willingness, even eagerness to die for the emperor would, it was believed, provide a magic multiplier effect that would squash all enemies. So surrender was not an option under any circumstance, and brutality was the cornerstone of the Imperial Japanese Army. Hmm. They also required a, quote, absolute, unhesitating, unthinking, blind obedience to orders. Wow. Yep. They were taught that they were being given orders from God, And, quote, no army in history so systematically instilled hatred in its troops as this version of the Imperial Japanese Army. Wow, I had no idea it was so intense. I I know. I I knew it was pretty intense, but not that. I didn't realize that. I didn't either. I had no idea. And honestly, I mean, I'm shocked that I've never heard of this incident. You'll understand why as we move Mm -hmm. forward. But... Yeah, we've all heard, you know, we know Pearl Harbor and that's sort of Mm -hmm. the, and Hiroshima, but that's like the extent of it. You know, we don't know, I didn't know anything about their past, especially because they're now such an ally and like a peaceful, neutral, Mm -hmm. you know, humble nation. nation. Yeah. Yeah, So it's really interesting to kind of go back and look at this blip in their culture. So I won't dwell on the horrors of becoming a soldier in the Imperial Japanese Army for much longer, but to give you an idea... One soldier, Shinji Ito, recalled that during swimming training, quote, a rope was tied around my body and I was thrown into the river from a boat. When I lost consciousness from swallowing too much water, I was pulled up. Once I caught, <laughs> once I caught my breath, I would be thrown back into the water. My uniform froze. <sighs> I'm just going to say, wow, like a thousand times. I'm telling you, as I was writing this, I was like, God, poor Sadie. There's like no way to react to the story. So it doesn't get any better. It gets much, much worse. (laughs) All right. Feel free to excuse yourself from (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, If you get tired, I'll just talk out of one side of my mouth. I'll just say the horrible (laughs) thing and be like, oh my God, that's crazy. Thank you. You could tag me in. There you go. (laughs) Um, uh, He also recalls being beaten so badly that the beatings, quote, permanently changed the shape of his face. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you guys, if you want to know more, go read the book. That is a tiny snippet of information about the training of this army. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the American flyboys. And I won't go, you know, back deep into the history of the United States and our armed forces. But flyboys were made up of members of the Navy Air Corps. 
And the young men who made up these airborne troops were all around graduation age the day that Pearl Harbor was bombed. One remembers hearing about the bombing on his actual graduation day. So these were young men, 18, 19 years old. The Navy Air Corps was considered a, quote, elite flying fraternity, and many joined because it was harder to get into than the Army and had a reputation of being the best of the best at the time. Hmm. World War II is the first time that combat would include aviation on the scale that it did, and the author describes the Flyboys as, quote, in bomber jackets, posing thumbs up, they epitomize masculine glamour, they were cool and they knew it, and any earthbound fool had to know it too. <laughs> it's like an old timey top gun. <laughs> exactly right. Yes. Their planes were named after curvy girlfriends and pinups whose curvy forms or pretty faces sometimes adorn their sides. And inside the cockpit, the flyboys were lone knights in an age of mass warfare. So very popular. Everybody wanted to be a flyboy. They were the tits, basically. <laughs> Chichijima was a very small island close to the more well-known Iwo Jima, and the area was often referred to as, quote, no man's land. There were critical short and long wave receivers on top of Chichijima's Mount Yoake and Asahi, and served as a main communication link between Imperial headquarters in Tokyo and troops in the Pacific. These receivers were intercepting U.S. military transmissions and using the information to their advantage. The U.S. military gave the Flyboys the task of destroying the radio stations to disrupt this communication. And this mission occurred right around the same time Iwo Jima fell and the troops raised the flag, which has been immortalized through the famous statue. So that very famous statue of the men pushing the flag up, that's, right. um, you know, in honor of the fall of Iwo Jima. So Chichijima was so critical for the Japanese and the Japanese knew that the Americans would eventually attack the island that it was very heavily armed and being defended by 25,000 Japanese troops in comparison to Iwo Jima's 22,000. Wow. Yeah. A lot of troops. A lot of troops. The island was made up of, quote, hilly inland and craggy coast, which made it much harder to approach from the sea. One Marine who later compared the two islands said, quote, Iwo was hell. Chichi would have been impossible. <laughs> I just don't like where any of this is going. <laughs> Hang on to your panties. <laughs> <laughs> Crucial supplies that had been routinely sent to Chichijima and would have been shared and shuttled to Iwo Jima had been cut off by the Americans. And the general feelings of the troops on the island was that, quote, their spirit warrior masters back in Tokyo had sentenced them to Gyokusai, meaning honorable and without surrender deaths. All 25,000 of them on this island. Yes. And again, they're just like ready to die for their leader. Yes. They were without supplies, without food. Mm -hmm. And I'm about to tell you a few little details, but it was bleak. It was very bleak. It was very hostile. Uh, it was not good. <laughs> <laughs> and they were scared. They were really scared. So the troops worked digging caves seven days a week under deplorable conditions. The troops were malnourished and surgery was performed in caves where maggots often came out of the wounds. Mm -mm. The island troops were led by General Yoshio Tachibana, who had led the inhumane missions in China and, quote, relished the scorched earth policies he had witnessed in China. He was one who loved to kill all, loot all, burn all. Even though they had the gift of ignorant youthfulness on their side, it is reported that the Flyboys were aware that there was an excellent chance that they wouldn't likely survive their mission to Chichijima, even writing heart-wrenching letters home to their families and girlfriends in case their dark premonitions came true. Their letters said things like, quote, I don't see how you could be any lonelier than I am. And, quote, do you think I'll ever make a good artist? If I had some paints and brushes, I would paint you a good picture. I know these boys. I yeah. the book goes into details of all of their lives and who they were, and they were just good boys. The last words of the last letter, nineteen-year-old Grady York wrote, were quote, "Pray for me." They had no idea just how awful their fates would be. Oh God, I have chills on my arms <laughs> and my legs. <laughs> 
So the men sailed to the island on an aircraft carrier, which was dangerous enough on its own. There were things like rotating propellers on deck that would routinely sever limbs and take <laughs> lives. <laughs> yeah, man, not okay. something you think about when you think about combat, but it was yeah. very common for pilots to back into their propellers and lose their limbs or lives. Wow. I know. There was also highly flammable jet fuel that was known to erupt into flames and bombs that could go off at any moment. And on February... <laughs> I mean, that's just getting there. <laughs> I know. Well, that's exactly it. It's like they, they talk about it, just getting to sailing to the mission yeah. was so dangerous. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of people didn't even make it to the mission. So on February 18th, 1945, their fates would be sealed as they took the air to begin the mission of dime bombing airfields and radio stations on the island of Chichijima. One pilot remembered, quote, it was overcast on the island. There was a hole in the clouds. A lot of planes were going through that hole, and the Japanese gunners just plugged that hole with anti-aircraft fire. Unfortunately, there was only one small, quote, punch bowl-like harbor for the flyboys to bomb, and it was surrounded by Japanese troops firing from all sides as well as above. And uh, one thing, there were a few missions. So there was a mission that shot at the harbor. Or we're trying to blow up things around the harbor. Um, I don't know exactly how many, but this was uh, one of the last missions. So, quote, one by one, the bombers dove and the Japanese gunners reaped their bloody harvest. There were a handful of bombing missions on the island, like I just mentioned. And of all the planes shot down near Chichijima, only two people survived long term. So multiple people just died. Um, mm -hmm. And of the people who made it, you know, being shot down, only two of them survived long term. One was shot down six months before our mission that we're going to refer to. And he was protected on a small raft by flyboy air fire for three hours and 13 minutes until a submarine could be dispatched to save him. So he just floated out there. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> this is brutal. Um, but he said he turned around yeah. and he saw a little periscope pop up oh and he was God. like, he thought he was, you know, he was like vomiting, bleeding, right. semi-conscious. And he sees this little periscope pop up and he was like, no yeah. fucking way. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's the, probably the most badass rescue you can imagine. Dude, <laughs> I, okay, not to sound corny, but I, you know, I'm always like, thank you for our service. I really, really believe, I believe honestly that if you volunteer in service of your country, you should probably never have to pay for anything ever again, no. you know? Yes. But I completely agree. Um, it does, it doesn't hurt to go and read history and read something like this book that doesn't, that spares no, you know, doesn't spare you um, mm -hmm. and your feelings mm -hmm. because it really does give you like an incredible insight into that sacrifice yeah a little we, tiny taste of it i yeah. cannot even like what we're going through right now is difficult but we don't know shit you know like mm -hmm. we don't know true struggle and i know that i'm very aware of that very aware of that but you know, this really put some shit into perspective for me this mm -hmm. week so so on the day of the attack of the radio stations four men would be shot down survive and swim to the island only to meet a fate beyond their worst nightmares mm -hmm. A few days later, a fifth soldier, Warren Earl, would be captured and added to their ranks. In total, there were two pilots, Warren Earl, Vaughn, and Floyd Hall, and three enlisted men, Jimmy Dye, Marv Mershon, and Grady York, being held captive on Chichijima. The men were captured and bound, and soldiers were encouraged to beat them at their will. Yeah, it makes me think about, like, there's that the legend of the astronauts getting pills to take if something terrible goes oh, wrong. Oh my God. Like, right. No, like maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Just, I have so much dread for these men. I know. Okay. I know. Well, and it was such a, I was actually talking to our grandmother about military service and, and it was just such an honorable time and they were fighting like true evil. So these guys were mm -hmm. unbelievably brave. Our soldiers are unbelievably brave. Yeah. The troops on Chichijima had suffered great loss at the hands of the Americans and were hungry for revenge. So the first four men spent their first five days on the island being beaten and interrogated. And then when Warren was captured, he was tied to a tree for three days with Jimmy and Grady. Soon after he arrived, so these men are tied to a tree, and soon after he arrived, 19-year-old Marv 
was taken to a cemetery and beheaded with a samurai sword. Oh, Jesus. Uh huh. As an early sacrifice for the wrath the Americans had rained down on the island. So these guys showed up, and the island is tense, and the leaders are psychotic and furious, mm-hmm. and everyone's afraid. And they were like, "I need a sacrifice." Basically, one yeah. of the one of the generals was like, "Okay, oh, right, I'm taking one of these guys because." He knows a lot of relieve the tension for his troops a little. Exactly right. So poor Marv, poor 19 year old Marv was the first sacrifice. So during World War II, it was common for prisoners of war to be impaled several times to die slowly so that the Japanese soldiers could absorb their life force before dying. Beheading was considered a sign of honor. So sometimes the Japanese showed American soldiers respect by ending their lives with a beheading. Other times they did not. So on February 24th, General Tachibana met with his comrade, Major Matoba, who was at the end of a three-day sake bender. <laughs> they continued the party, by the way. They, mm-hmm. He shows up and Major Matoba is drunk as a skunk and they continue to drink. So they met to discuss the fact that their soldiers were breaking down, uh, their rations were depleting rapidly, and the fact that it was almost certain that the Americans would attack again. As they drank, their conversation turned to the more than 150,000 Japanese troops who had gone to New Guinea. When the troops arrived on New Guinea with insufficient supplies on the largely inhospitable island, they'd been encouraged to survive through, quote, local provisioning. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. So faced with no food to support the troops on the island, they began to eat their dead. No. Sipping their sake, General Tachibana and Major Matoba spoke of the situation with a perverse admiration. Oh, that was a quote. And it's important to note that of the soldiers that went to New Guinea, only 10,000 survived out of 150,000. Holy cow. That's not okay. All right. So it's time for a really, really bad thing. Okay. Anybody who doesn't want to hear a bad thing, skip ahead 30 seconds. But here's one of the worst things I've ever heard in my life. You can skip now. (laughs) (laughs) So mostly they would eat, you know, they'd eat each other and prisoners, obviously. But the worst thing that I read that they did was in order to preserve the meat, they would keep the prisoners alive and Mm. take portions as they needed them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, all right i'm here i'm okay. still listening <laughs> okay everybody's back you're back um yep. we're moving on from the horrible thing so later that afternoon the general and major were invited to colonel kato's quarters to continue their drinking and to enjoy a meal of sukiyaki style meat and vegetables general tachibana immediately commented that there wasn't nearly enough meat to go around and major motoba became very angry sending his hosts into a panic mm-hmm. A now very drunk General Tachibana was struck with the divine idea and asked Matoba about, quote, the execution and getting some meat. No. Yeah. No. Quote, one had to have enough fighting spirit to eat human flesh. And when referring to the flesh, he used the word chemo. Quote, chemo refers specifically to the liver and more generally to the internal organs. The word can also refer to spiritual or mental strength. So when Tachibana spoke of eating Marv's chemo, he was using a term that referred to an organ but had much more meaning. At around 4.30 p.m., Matoba called his captain and ordered him to cut chemo from Marv's body. Mm. The captain tried to protest, and when Matoba insisted, the captain enlisted the battalion surgeon to do the horrible job. Keep in mind that Marv had already been dead and buried for a day, so the soldiers had to exhume the body to remove the chemo, which was specifically his liver and a section of his thigh. (sighs) Oh. (laughs) I know. While most of the party declined the chemo, saying, quote, they had to demonstrate the necessary courage. So basically saying, I'm not worthy. Mm -hmm. That That was their brilliant out. And I do think it was a brilliant out. Uh, yeah. M- Matoba and, the, and Tachibana ate most of their portions before the air raid siren went off, ending their dinner party. Oh, God. 
Jimmy, Grady, and Warren remained tied to the tree for three days and were punched and kicked by the occasional soldier, but were mostly ignored. It seems that the Japanese soldiers were, quote, tired from overwork, undernourished, and depressed by their prospects. One soldier even took pity on them and sneaked the men cakes that he had bought with his own money, thinking it would be all right since it wasn't military supplied food. Mm. And throughout the story, there are, I'm going to touch on a few of them, but there are like constant incidences of people trying to help them. Yeah. You know, these mm-hmm. soldiers were not all awful, just their, their leaders. I mean, right. some of them probably were, but it was really their their leaders. So... On Monday, February 26th, Tachibana decided he was done with his prisoners and sent Warren Vaughn for questioning and ordered the executions of Jimmy and Grady. Are they the ones that were tied to the tree? Yes, exactly. So he was like, I'm bored of these guys. I don't, you know, they're not serving. They're not providing our soldiers with a lot of relief. Our soldiers aren't really interested in them. So he sent one for interrogation and the other two to be killed. They tied Grady to a telephone pole while they decided he would execute him. They chose men who had lost fellow soldiers to American bombs, and those men killed Grady with sharpened bamboo spears and bayonets. Grady did not cry out or call out while being pierced to death by multiple Japanese soldiers. Yeah. That's that's horrifying. Horrifying. And, you know, again, they go into great detail about all these executions, Mm -hmm. and I'm sparing some of the detail because it's exhausting, but it was hard to get the men to do these executions every in every single case like they wasn't like they were just finding no 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 i didn't read a single instance of anybody being like hooray my turn like everybody Mm -hmm. looked away walked away back you know like they really tried to not participate that's awful yeah so it was then ordered for jimmy to be tied to a wooden crossbar and executed with bamboo spears but he was intercepted on the way to his death Jimmy was sent to help interpret U.S. military messages, and so his life was temporarily spared. He was sent to Captain Yoshi, who was good friends and drinking buddies of our good pal, chemo eater, Major Matoba. Mm -hmm. Jimmy was tired and terrified, and he was assigned to a translator who recognized this. So instead of setting to work monitoring U.S. intel over the radios, they chatted about their lives instead. Mm -hmm. Quote, others noticed yeah so jimmy didn't do a good job of intercepting or translating during his two days under yoshi's watch so his execution was ordered to take place at 4 p.m on the second day when asked why yoshi ordered his death quote for yoshi it was an effort to raise morale he had to prepare everyone for dying we were all going to die we thought it's a mass hysteria It's impossible to analyze unless you are in that bizarre situation. The reactions of a cornered rat are not normal. Mm. So Yoshi announced the plans in the mess hall. And at the end of the announcement, he ordered the unit's doctor to remove Jimmy's liver when it was complete. The doctor and a nearby lieutenant, who was only 22 years old, were dumbstruck, but agreed to carry out the order to avoid shame. I mean, again, we go into great detail. And these guys were like, WTF, (laughs) Yoshi, (laughs) where is this coming from? And especially, you know, because they were not far off from the honorable samurai who, you know, that was like the Bushido, the way of the warrior was not to do crazy shit like this. You know, it was very honorable. Deaths were honorable. Serving was honorable. And they were all just like, what is happening? The lieutenant said, quote, I was an officer, so I have a sword, but I had never used one. I had no such experience, and I desperately wanted to escape. But we were on an island. There was no escape. Wow. I know. When the time came to execute Jimmy, his translator actually lied and said, quote, Captain Yoshi is going to parade you in front of the men, and then you'll come back. To this day, I still think it was better not to tell him. No, buddy. God. (laughs) No, and this translator is such a sweetheart. (laughs) So Jimmy was told to sit at the edge of a deep hole with his feet dangling while the commander questioned him. Captain Yoshi announced, quote, Watch closely. What today is another's fate may be your fate tomorrow. He then barked, Kire, which means cut. Mm. Which chills me. Mm -hmm. 
to the bone. Yeah. One by one, three officers sliced at Jimmy's neck until he was dead. Oh, God. He did not die after the first blow. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> I know. What are you doing to me? Dude, and I'm telling you, I'm being very merciful. I yeah. <laughs> really tried to pick and choose. <sighs> after his liver was removed, the doctor looked up and said, quote, I think that is enough. I don't want to cut anymore. Do you think <sighs> that is enough? The officer had agreed that it was. Yeah. So by ordering the beheading, Yoshi joined Motoba in the ranks of spirit warrior and was excited to join him as spirit cannibal. Yoshi forced several officers to eat the liver with him while they drank sake that night in the officer's mess. There are also unsubstantiated rumors that Jimmy's whole body was cut up and served in the soldier's soup, but that has not been proven and is thought to have just been an exaggeration of the actual story. Not that there needs to be an exaggeration. I think that the facts are plenty. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, just one person eating a part of a person is yeah. awful enough. Yeah. Well, yes. It kind of becomes one of those stories that happens a lot for me in the really gruesome, you know, like serial killers and where and I think World War Two in general, it's so awful. It's hard to like. Yeah. I start to. It's so gruesome. It doesn't feel real, right? It, so yes. like the words that are coming out of your mouth, yes, right now that are going into my ears, it's like mm, that can't be. That's yes, just, this is a story. You know, it doesn't. It's it's impossible to really imagine that actually all happening. I could not agree more. And when I was reading all of this, it's unfathomable that you could live through something like this and not just crumble like yeah, turn to dust or turn into like some kind of screaming psychotic lunatic like these right. people went on to live lives you know yeah. and like have families and have jobs like right. how the fuck do you do that right, right. i mean no, a lot I of people think... now don't and i don't blame them you know right yeah it's, no same it's... thing with the holocaust survivors it's just like how did you ever how... i don't know i don't or... know our ability to persevere is incredible. It's incredible. I hope to God I never have to know. And I'm so grateful. Mm -hmm. So uh, Yoshi did keep a portion of the liver in his room and would offer it up to the officers who visited him. Okay. This guy needs to stop I know. it. Like no. enough is enough. I'm I know. <laughs> I know. It's one thing to take it yourself. It's another thing to keep like a little... <sighs> like no a moose bouche in your office for yeah, when people come to visit you so yeah horrifying it's disgusting uh quote people were afraid to eat it and afraid to refuse to eat it <sighs> so jimmy who had just been executed his girlfriend gloria later reported that she had an eight by ten photo of him that she would kiss and sleep with at night quote one night it fell on the floor and broke i woke up and it scared me I knew something had happened. Later I learned that was the night Jimmy died. No. <laughs> <laughs> I have more chills on my arms. I know. Uh, I know. <laughs> so it's not only is this like a horrifying tale of cannibalism, there's also a ghost story, a miniature ghost yeah. story in it. The poor dear. On Friday, February 23rd, Floyd Hall and Warren Earl met for the first time in Major Horry's headquarters, where Warren had been interrogated for several days. The two men, quote, walked about freely, were fed well, and were not beaten under Horry's care. They even taught Horry some English and, quote, how to enter a nightclub, order drinks, to do checks, and other such things. In one lesson, Warren even took the major's hand to teach him how to snuggle a honey on the dance floor. <laughs> <laughs> then oh. Captain Yoshi appeared. Oh, God. This guy. This guy. Yoshi claimed he needed another prisoner to help intercept broadcasts and learn that Hori had two. He was given Warren Earl. Mm. The translator that had worked with Jimmy before his death had also been assigned to work with Warren and was extremely protective of him, knowing what had happened to Jimmy. Warren and his translator didn't give Yoshi very much information over the first few days, and eventually Warren admitted to his translator, quote, he knew more information than what I got out of him, and I could kill him, but I would not get the information from him. Wow. I know, again, brave. So brave. So brave. 
Warren's stays in the radio room were somewhat pleasant, and he even made friends with an English-speaking Hawaiian who worked next to him. Floyd continued his English lessons with Hori and also lived in relative comfort. And they go into this more, these guys working with Hori and working a radio station for a while, and they did actually become like pretty good friends with their captors. It's very sweet and heartbreaking to read about. So in the early morning hours of March 10th, 334 B-29s loaded with napalm roared over Iwo Jima and Chichijima. Quick side note, that fleet of B-29s were worth $200 million Wow! at a time when $1,700 was a sufficient yearly salary to support a family <laughs> of four. Holy cow. Yeah. I just Whoa. thought that was too interesting not to include $200 million. How do you, where do you wow. even get that much money back then? Yeah, they're just, it's monopoly money. They're it's like incredible. Yeah. So they dropped 8,519 napalm bombs on Tokyo. Wow. Quote, you could see the fires for 100 miles or more. Mm-hmm. Almost 100,000 civilians perished in the flames. Jeez. Here's um, something, another awful detail that I read. So this is a time to skip if you don't want to hear the awful detail. Um, but, quote, babies exploded on their mother's oh. backs. <laughs> yeah. It was basically, because oh. Tokyo was a, you know, tatami bats in wood. You know, it was not a right. modern metal, you know, steel city yet. And so... Right. They just dropped napalm all over it and burnt it to the ground. And later, you know, again, I won't get into too much detail about the war, but we basically burnt Japan. I didn't realize the extent of the damage we did. We burnt Japan down. It's shocking. And it was all from the air. They, They are confident that the Air Force and pilots basically won the war for us against Japan because we just... Wow. They couldn't keep up. Oh, and I bring up that story because it just, it's just, it, this is happening why these men are in captivity and it's just intensifying the fear and the mm-hmm. hatred and these things keep happening. All these men are captive on this island, even the people who are the captors, like they have nowhere to go and it's just getting so tense and terrifying. So on March 14th, quote, all of a sudden Warren stood up, took his headphones off and told us that the Americans had just announced, quote, All organized resistance on Iwo Jima has ended. Hmm. The news was passed to Captain Yoshi, who sent it up the chain, and, quote, in all probability, the emperor learned that Iwo Jima was lost as a result of a message intercepted by a flyboy on Chichijima. (laughs) Yeah. Wait, say that one more time? (laughs) Yeah, so basically, because Warren, he was listening and intercepting the American messages, Right. Um, translating them. He was the one that heard it first. He's the one he wow. told Yoshi and then Yoshi sent it up the chain to the emperor. Wow. And so the emperor found out quick, more quickly than he would have because of an American flyboy. Wow. Yep. So on March 17th, Warren was lounging with his Hawaiian friend when a truck full of Navy men came to retrieve him. Quote, Warren sensed they came for him. His friend said, he stood up, turned to me and shook my hand. He had a sad look in his eyes. I felt it was the final goodbye, the way he said it and the way he looked at me. Warren was taken to a bomb crater where 150 people were gathered, including Yoshi and his fellow spirit warrior, Lieutenant Yasuo Kurosaki. They were both drunk. Mm Kurosaki explained that he was about to have his head chopped off and asked if he was ready to meet his death, to which the 24-year-old replied, yes. They asked who would come forward to carry out the execution, and no one would come forward again. A soldier was eventually forced to complete the horrible job, and Warren knelt down, rolled down his collar in an act of defiance, it was supposed to be the executioner's job, Mm -hmm. and was beheaded with one blow. Once again, the order was given for the doctor to dissect the flyboy and remove his liver. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, Floyd had been with Hori for a month, exchanging English and Japanese lessons and enjoying each other's company. Hori later wrote, quote, I talked with Hall frequently. I ate with him often. He was lively and intelligent and gave me great pleasure. He was born in Missouri. <laughs> 
The two even discussed visiting each other in their respective countries, and Floyd joked that he was going to show Hori a good time in the States. Floyd was not tied up and was basically free during his time with Hori. He even attended parties and drank sake with his captors, and you can't help but think he must have grown confident in his eventual freedom. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Hori was only an intelligence officer and had no power to save his new friend. On March 9th, Matoba issued the following order. One, the battalion wants to eat the flesh of the American aviator, Lieutenant Hall. Two, First Lieutenant Kanmuri will see to the rationing of this flesh. Three, Cadet Sakabe will attend the execution and have the liver and gallbladder removed. On March 23rd, the intelligence officers on Chichijima received the message that there were 30 survivors from the fall of Iwo Jima in the cliffs of the island. They planned to make a bonsai charge against the American soldiers on the island. And the bonsai charge is a sneak attack, basically. So the American soldiers didn't know that they had survived. They sent a message of goodbye to their comrades on Chichijima. This heightened the intensity on Chichijima as they knew an American attack would be imminent after the sneak attack was carried out on Iwo Jima. On March 24th, the call came that it was time to begin the process of Floyd's execution. Hori requested a humane death for his unlikely friend, and Kanmuri agreed to be as humane as possible. When Floyd's hands were tied in front of him, he continued to joke with the people near him in the broken Japanese he'd learned from Hori and joked with a Navy man. This part really fucks me up. It's so sad to think about. Quote, Floyd, hands tied, held in a guardhouse, was trying to make human connections with anybody. <laughs> Matoba told his corps men that they would attend the execution and dissection to, quote, study the human body. On March 25th, Floyd was taken to a nearby crater, and after a few refusals to carry out the execution, a lower-ranking officer finally agreed to behead the poor airman. Quote, a crowd milled around Floyd at the guardhouse. All of the men were talking about the coming execution but Floyd couldn't understand enough to know that the men were speaking of his death. Mm. He kept his cool and continued joking. The Japanese soldiers engaged him and gave him cigarettes. Finally, Floyd was made to kneel and was given a glass of whiskey to drink and a cigarette to smoke. They blindfolded him and the fatal blow was delivered, partially decapitating him. Another officer was ordered to bayonet him after his body fell into the crater. The officers were assembled around the crater and the dissection began. Floyd's liver and a portion of his thigh meat were wrapped and taken for the high-ranking officer's feast later that night. Um, he was supposed to survive, Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! And then it turns out he can survive a decapitation at both and maybe no. he's still alive today and he has nine okay. grandchildren. Thank you. Yep. Um, quote, all the soldiers on Chichijima believed that, like the executed flyboys, they would soon be in their graves. They were wrong. Chichijima was never invaded. <laughs> Just never invaded. Never invaded. Wow. All that fear, all that shit for nothing. Nothing. Wow. So... One more note. Do you remember the flyboy who floated in the water for over three mm -hmm. hours and was submarine. saved yeah. by the submarine? Mm -hmm. Turns out we all know who that man was. It was none other than George H.W. Motherfucking Bush. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, That's amazing. Megan wrote, our editor wrote, all caps, audible, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Isn't that crazy? George mm -hmm. Bush avoided, narrowly avoided being wow. eaten. And the crazy thing is he had no idea. He didn't know it happened because nobody did because it was classified for so many years. Like it was declassified in the early 2000s and that's the first he heard of it. He had no idea what he had escaped. 
whatsoever. Wow. I know. Wow. I know. Wow. Yeah, man. So that is the story of the Chichijima incident. And AKA <laughs> Japanese war cannibalism. Oh God. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> so I found this because I was like, I want to do kind of a creepy, spooky one. You know, I was in the mood uh -huh. for something sort of creepy or spooky. And I went on Reddit at two o'clock in the morning, which I do oh, not God. recommend. Like, I think I'm <laughs> tough. I love horror. I love true crime. It's what I do. It's my favorite thing. I scared the absolute shit out of myself <laughs> reading this thread. But it, yeah. ca it came up in the thread and I was like, excuse me, what? George... H.W. Bush just escaped being eaten by Japanese cannibals. Like, oh, how have I crazy. never heard of this? <laughs> and, never, I've heard little murmurs of his, you know, like his yeah. basically being a war hero. Yeah. I, I had no idea. Yeah. Full blown war badass. Like, survived wow. that. Incredible. But yeah, I had no idea. I've never heard of this. I, it's, there's a movie. A uh, movie was made out of the book, but I've also never heard of the movie. So, and there aren't very many, like Paula Zahn interviewed George Bush about it and things, but I couldn't, other than this book, I couldn't find any major articles. I just find it so fascinating, especially because we are an Air Force family. Like our Both sides of our family are pilots and airmen. Our grandfather on our dad's side was a mechanic for the Air Force. Our mom's mom, I actually Googled him and found an article about him. And during World War II and the Korean conflict, he flew 83 combat missions. Holy shit. You said our mom's mom. Our mom. mom's dad. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Our, our pop, who we didn't know. Yeah. He died when I was a baby. But yeah, he was awarded the Legion of Merit, Silver Star, and the Army Air Medal with five oh, clusters and numerous service decorations. So wow. I mean, just say 83 missions is ins feels insane to me. And then knowing now what he was up against and what he experienced. I don't know, man. It's very, very humbling. Mm -hmm. So thanks guys. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you guys for fighting these fucking wars. Like what yeah, man. the heck? Wow. Yeah. Oh, I mean, good job. I'm a little <laughs> bit traumatized. <laughs> oh, no. I'm also very curious to know more like i really am i'm yeah it, it's i think from many of us the world war ii when you learn about it it's so heavily revolves around europe yes and you know that there's you know the japanese side of it also but it's not often that you get into the details and yeah that's exactly right mm -hmm. i don't even think about the japanese when i think about world war ii unless pearl harbor comes up like that's the only time i ever think about it and I didn't, I had no idea of the extent of the brutality and, mm. you know, like how complicated it was. And I can honestly say like, this is all I've thought about all week because yeah, I was right. so immersed in this book and I highly recommend reading it if you're at all curious. Oh, uh, it's called, let me scroll up, Flyboys, what is it? Flyboys, A True Story of Courage by James Bradley. Mm. And it's written, like I said, it's written in a very measured way, which I appreciated. It's very... Uh, he's an expert on the Japanese in World War II. He wrote a whole book about the rape of Nanking, which I will not be reading. Um, mm -hmm. He touches on that in the, in the book, and he, I mean, he goes through the, all of the conflicts and all of the fire bombings, and it's a lot. But it is written in a very palatable way. I don't know. It's just written in a way that I found so intriguing. Yeah. Phew. I'm sorry to Good you job. and no. America, okay. my our darling listeners. I apologize, but. I hope you enjoyed it, quote unquote. Enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you're if you're tuning in for some murder, you got a good dose of it. Too. Yeah, that'll <laughs> that'll tide you over till our Saturday release. This will be coming out. This will be coming out on Wednesday. So for <laughs> plenty of murder, a murder a day. Oh God, I know, yeah. I know. It's. It's wow. a lot, but it, I think it's such an interesting story and yeah. one that I haven't, I'm really shocked hasn't been told more often. Yeah. I, re I watched, um, it's been making me think of the Pacific uh, HBO like miniseries that mm. came out mm -hmm. well, you know, a while ago, probably 2009. I watched that and that was really informative. I mean, it's not, you know, like true, but I think they, they base it off of 
actual men's experiences yep. in, in the Pacific during World War II. So I'm a little embarrassed to say that like that's the extent of my I mean, knowledge. I think that would be the case for a lot of people, and I would include myself in that. I'm interested in history, but I do get bogged down in dates and geography. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't have any retention for that part of it. And so I get a little intimidated and overwhelmed by it. And I honestly didn't learn about history until college when I took art history and suddenly there was a context for it for me. And so I was like, oh shit, that's what happened. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it is helpful to have a vehicle for that information that works for you. And in my right. case, you know, <laughs> it's true crime and horror. I'm like, <laughs> what happened? Tell me more. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I, uh, if this is a good, if this intrigues you, take this opportunity to read the book and learn more about it because I learned so much and poor everybody in my life right now. It's all I've talked about. I talked to our 95, is grandma 95. Just turned 95. Yeah. I talked to her today and I was like, what was it like in World War? You know, like the last thing she wants to talk about right now. (laughs) (laughs) But I grilled her all about it and grandpa's involvement. And yeah, it's fascinating, man. Crazy shit. There you go, guys. There you go, guys. Have a, have a nice night. Sleep tight. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Oh, oh, one more thing. Um, the, an article kept coming or articles kept coming up about the case. It's been widely covered and I don't remember his name, but the, um, the Japanese cannibal that's out, that got out the modern case. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, mm-hmm. The guy like killed and ate somebody got caught, went to prison and is now out. Oh no. Yeah. A, a few podcasts have done it. Um, it's fascinating shit, but yeah. it, I would type in what it, cause I couldn't remember Chichi Jima in the beginning. So I kept typing in Japanese cannibals and, uh, <laughs> He would come up and I was, you know, of course, old freaking science, brain scientist Courtney kicks in. And I was like, I wonder if there is, you know how they say trauma is genetically transmitted. Mm-hmm. So you you hold some of the trauma that your ancestors held. It, they've proven that it right. comes through your DNA. So I was like, I wonder if that, I mean, you know, it's anybody. There's cannibals all over the place. The cannibal cop and, you know, it's a, it's not just a Japanese condition by any stretch, but it did make me wonder. And I looked it up and I didn't see that. It's like, if your ancestor was a cannibal, you're more likely to be have like cannibalistic urges, but it does affect your DNA. If you eat human flesh, it does change your DNA because your body tries to defend itself from this um, brain disease that you can get from eating human flesh. And so they can tell you can you can test and find out if your ancestors were cannibals. Jesus, um, I know. So new, like twenty three of me. Thing. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> Cannibal uh, party. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, if you're like me, uh, this case will send you right down the rabbit hole of places <laughs> that no man should go. You're welcome. Uh, Anyway, yeah. enough about cannibals. Um, yeah. Do we have any businesses? Any businesses? Uh, yes, we have one business that's the exact opposite of cannibals, and that is um, artisanal uh, small batch glitter lollipops, oversized <laughs> glitter lollipops. <laughs> Are we giving away our, our secrets? Yeah, well, just to get people excited, we've commissioned a limited run of they will kill oversized glitter lollipops. <laughs> and I'm very excited about it. Yeah, they're pretty awesome. <laughs> they're so awesome. I hate the word cheeky, but they are cheeky AF. They're so cute. <laughs> I'm really excited to get them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they will go to our Patreon supporters and, you know, probably the rest of you too, somehow, because we love you and I feel yeah. very uh, grateful for you. And so I'm sure there'll be giveaways and different things like that. But um, we have our Patreon up. It's still kind of a soft launch. We were talking about it on the podcast, but we haven't any, made any like hard announcements yeah. on Instagram or anything. But um, we're kind of waiting for our, our glitter lollipops and <laughs> to show up. <laughs> yeah, we've got some goodies. And uh, those of you who, who sign up now will reap the benefits m- much more than if you wait down the road. 
Because, I mean, part of it is that we're giving away bonus episodes for free while in quarantine. So if you sign up for a higher tier, one of the perks is getting free episodes. But in lieu of free episodes, we'll send you some extra goodies. So more about that as as we actually have the physical product to send you. But um, it's going to be cute. Yeah, it'll be really fun. Be really fun. Uh, <laughs> thank you uh, to everybody who keeps sending us nice shit man you guys are the best <laughs> i know you are absolute it's, angels i know it's it's surreal it, it really it's so crazy it's so crazy yeah, just, just, go ahead <laughs> just climbing climbing our numbers are climbing our interactions are strengthening so we really love you guys a lot I like having i have to i'm still in like eating livers mindset over here i'm trying to shift out of it out of it you should just be able to bounce right back and flower shower our listeners with praise and love oops (laughs) (laughs) oh god God is right um and next week we're gonna start reading off our reviews i think we're both a little brain dead from japanese cannibal war but uh get your reviews in now because we're gonna start reading them off in little chunks next week as a thank you to those of you who take the time to do it because it's so nice if you want to hear your name coming out of our mouths (laughs) who doesn't have a line around the door oh man (laughs) bum rush bum rush apple apple's gonna crash because of our listeners (laughs) shit what else anything else i don't think so we love you guys so much yeah, we do. We really do. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right, I'll wrap it up so Sadie can go take a nap or cry or whatever she eats. <laughs> um, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and then Twitter. It's called Twitter at They Will Kill. You can email us at They Will Kill Podcast at gmail.com. And you can check out our website which is theywillkill.com. That's right. Please rate, review, subscribe uh, wherever you listen. Yes. Podcast. Yes. Thank you, AJ, for your music. Very much. AJ Bergantz, to be Very exact. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, He's so famous now because of my jingle that I sang for him last week that he goes just by AJ. That's by age. 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 He's still going to sue you, AJ. <laughs> I'm doing that thing um, where you point at your eyes with your two fingers and then point your two uh, fingers at AJ. His eyes. <laughs> uh, and remember. Um, spent. Fuck it. Thank your veterans. Take care of them. Give uh, them free food. Give them free housing. Yeah. Give them free yes. med- med- medicalness, medication. Mm-hmm. What's it called? Healthcare. Yep. Healthcare. <laughs> uh, give them hugs, support psychedelic drugs to help their brain rewire to be give less. them service dogs give them service dogs give them fucking anything they want honest to god gold nuggets <laughs> doubloons nuggets <laughs> rubies any everything I, thank yes. you thank you thank you from the bottom of my heart i yes there's not enough thank yous and you can have i'll cook you dinner i'll do something <laughs> no you'll make them a hello fresh Oh my god. I love HelloFresh. Almost as, <laughs> I love it almost as much as I love our veterans. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank we you so much for listening. Love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> we do love you so much. <laughs> so my sister needs a break. So that's it. We love you so much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.